thanks everyone for coming. So uh, I'm Rich Osa, I'm the head of data engineering at Dojo. So I'm responsible for setting the technical and strategic direction of how we process and manage data at scale. Um, hi, I'm Sandeep, I'm data lab from engineering lead. I'm responsible for archi architecting and executing data mesh architecture by building self-serve data platforms at Dojo. So you probably haven't heard of Dojo, but we're one of the largest fintechs in Europe by net revenue. So we power around one in 10 face-to-face uh, -face transactions in the UK every day, uh, mainly for the experience economy. So these are your bars, your pubs, your restaurant, uh, and maybe even you know, your corner shop. Um, we also have a consumer-facing app that allows you to virtually join the queue uh, for high street restaurants, things like that, for up to two kilometers away. So Dojo was born uh, around two years ago, and it was the move as a business from being an independent sales organization so reselling another company's product for the last eight to 10 years um, to a tech, uh, basically you know, a true FinTech offering uh, with the end-to-end -end, uh, you know, payments platform. So as you can see here, this has really resulted in a hockey stick style growth. So something I hadn't really appreciated until I joined Dojo was you know, actually what happens when you make a card payment. So we're just gonna go into this briefly because it will help frame some of the challenges that we've had to overcome uh, on the, the data platform side. So the first thing that happens when you tap your card on the card machine is that it takes details from the card and send these to the authorization gateway. So this is something that we have running uh, in the public cloud. These are then decrypted by a hardware security module uh, using keys provided by the card schemes. Uh, and then these card details are then forwarded to the card network. So this is basically the person that's, that's issued the card, the logo you've got on your card. So it could be Visa, MasterCard, American Express. They then look up who's actually issued the cards. So this is the bank. Uh, and then your bank says, you know, runs various checks behind the scenes and says, you know, do we want to honor this transaction? Has it passed our fraud checks? That type of thing. They'll then send that system, that response back to the card network that then gets sent back to us, uh, the authorization gateway, and the card machine will say yes or no, let's go ahead. So all of these steps happen in you know, the blink of an eye, five, 600 milliseconds, so it's very, very quick. So all of these processes generate a lot of data. And what I've just shown you there is just the authorization side of the transaction. So in essence, everything goes okay it doesn't encompass things like reversals or chargebacks or refunds, and that's added complexity. So it's important to highlight that no funds have actually changed hands at this point. It's just a promise between the merchant and the cardholder to pay. So around a year ago, we migrated to a data mesh architecture, uh, and this has really been crucial to scaling uh, the business. So what we're gonna talk about today is just one pillar uh, of the data mesh architecture but encompassing three other pillars uh, in the architecture and design. So we had three main challenges, you know, the regulatory, the complexity, and scalability uh, concerns. So it's touching on the regulatory first. So at Dojo, because we're, uh, you know, we own the end-to-end -end ex payments experience, we're an e-money institution. Uh, we're regulated by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. So with this comes some quite strict uh, regulatory requirements most notably the fact that we have to ensure the whole time that we've segregated the funds that we've taken you know, from cards to the funds that we use to you know, transact on a day-to-day -day basis and run the business. So at the scale we operate, this is safeguarding over three billion pounds a month. And on the data engineering side, this is where you know, the approximate value in a float column and the exact you know, value in a numeric column really starts to, you know, in, it really starts to matter when you're rounding up those half pennies, which could be thousands and thousands of pounds. The next thing is on uh, PCI DSS. Uh, so because we you know, take those raw card numbers off the credit card, we have to ensure the whole time uh, that we're complying uh, with you know, these standards. Uh, and it's ensuring that you know, they're always encrypted, and Sandeep will go further in a minute into exactly what that means. The next is on the complexity side. So there's significant complexity, not only in number, but the nature of the files that we have to process. And just missing one out of several hundred thousand files in a day could affect our safeguarding position, and therefore, you know, we could be subject to disclosure to the FCA. There's also a direct correlation between the number of transactions that are processed and the volume of data that we have to process as a result. Now, that can also vary you know, throughout the year. So you know, a Tuesday following uh, a bank holiday uh, in the UK, 
we would get three times the amount of data that we would normally have to process on a normal weekday. And therefore, we need a solution that can scale with that without having to think about it too much. So this is the only way that the business understands how we're transacting. And internally, we refer to this as running a nuclear power station. So it can't fail. So just to illustrate this complexity very quickly. So this is a snapshot of just one of many reconciliation processes that happens every single day. So what you can see on the left-hand side is you know, the authorizations that are taken by that card machine. And on the right, the net settlements, the amount that we're paying out to merchants' bank accounts every single day. So this one process alone requires the processing of 30 different types of files and in many different you know, file formats. And all this, by the way, is within PCI scope. So we really had to abstract away this complexity. You know, it's not just a case of receiving you know, an Excel file or an XML file. We have many, many different file formats. And that's the easy part. Many of these are also proprietary file formats where there's no you know, standard libraries to pass them. It's something that you have to write and it's truly bespoke. So we really needed a solution that abstracted away this complexity and transformed these files into a consistent file format. And we decided on Avro for various reasons we'll go on to in a minute. So Sandeep's now going to go through kind of the platform offering uh, that we, you know, we got to uh, and various other things that we had to consider. Thanks, Richard. <coughs> so uh, platform offering. Pl platform as a service was the, uh, the, the best way to go forward to solve this problem. So we built a file processing platform which was self-serve, fault tolerant, and highly scalable. We divided the platform into four components. First one is connectors, which is responsible for to get the data from multiple different external data points. Then we have PCI platform, which is responsible for um, masking the credit card information, and then sending that data to non-PCI platform, which is responsible for validating that data and doing the transformation and generating the chunk Debra files. Then we have destination, which is to stream the data into a data warehouse like Snowflake, Google BigQuery, or any other external cloud storage. Let's jump right into connectors. Connectors, we have the main important piece of software which we are running in connectors is Arclone. It's an open source software, which is really, really good in terms of syncing uh, files between two a target and a destination. It, 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 uh, the, the most of the workload is files, and that's why it, it works really good for us. We also build a custom webhook platform, which is to get data from webhook posting. Um, this, is, uh, uh, this is also deployed on Kubernetes, and this is also deployed on Kubernetes. The third one is serverless functions. So this part is uh, to get the data from APIs. So sometimes we have to download reports from uh, any API, from you know, any kind of external vendor and to have to process that multiple times a day. So these functions are doing that. We also have a vendor which sends the data into Gmail attachments. So we actually have to crawl that Gmail uh, uh, you know, account and go to that attachment, download that attachment, and send it to the object storage. We use these connectors uh, to, to send the data to uh, PCI platform and non-PCI platform. Uh, but before jumping into PCI platform, let's uh, just uh, uh, talk a bit about PCI compliance. PCI compliance is a set of standards which are to set there to, to protect the credit card information for a cardholder. Uh, they bring their own, when you're building a PCI platform, it, it, PCI compliance bring its own uh, challenges. And there are, key, there are three key points which we had to really, really carefully uh, look into it while we were designing the PCI platform. One was that the credit card information has to be transmitted uh, in a secure channel. That means it has to be uh, you know, encrypted in transit and the channel has to be not public. The second thing was strong encryption. So uh, you cannot store clear PAN information uh, just like that. It has to be encrypted or masked. And the third one was that the platform has to be audited every year for security reasons and you have to comply to those set of standards and make sure that your platform is running through those standards. Uh, so we created an application uh, which process the input file and mask the credit card information. And the application workflow is something like that. So you have, you get a file, you decrypt the file, and then you encrypt the file with your own keys and put that into archives. And that is for auditing purposes. The next part is, uh, we can also have files coming in a zip. So we can have 10,000 files in a zip file, or we can have just files. 
So if it's a zip file, it might contain non-PCI and PCI files, both together. So we open the zip file, we check, okay, whether this file contains PANs or not. If it contains PANs, we do the masking. If it doesn't contain PANs, we straight send it to non-PCI. And at the end of the day, this file outputs into a non-PCI bucket. Now, uh, this is how it looks like uh, in end-to-end. -end. So we, are, we, are, we have deployed all of our applications and workloads in Kubernetes. And the connector part, we are only using R clone in this in this in this in PCI scope because our most of our data is coming from files and every all, all of these files are in PCI scope and this runs as an R clone uh, Kubernetes jobs uh, clone job sorry and they run like every five minutes every two minutes based on based on the need and they they sync these these external data points or buckets or SFTP servers to this object storage. The moment the file starts getting created here, there will be a file creation events into the queue. So in our case, we are deployed in, on GCP, um, Google Cloud. So we use PubSub as a queue. And we have all the events of file creation start getting appended into the queue. Then we have deployed our masker service, which is a PCI service, which we just talked about. Uh, and that is subscribed to this queue. And it's reading one event at a time from the queue. And the event is like file creation event the metadata information like file name, where the file is, etc. that information, and then uh, it opens the file, it performs the masking, it sends the mask file to the object storage, and also it archives the files. Uh, as you can see, we also use HPA here because we have very strict SLAs, and we have sometimes we have like 250,000 files at any given in, uh, point in time, and we have to process that as soon as possible. So. Uh, for that, we are using horizontal port scaling and cluster uh, auto scaling to hand in hand to reach to reach the scaling of the platform. And and scaling comes with its own challenges. Uh, and one of the biggest challenge, and it's a very small thing, but it it was very very difficult to to come to to a point where we can decide, okay, what should be the request amount of a resource like CPU and memory? What should be the maximum we should give to a pod? And also, like how many ports we have to run to in terms of to process like say 250,000 files, and what should be the cluster capacity? Like how should how many number of nodes we have to run? We cannot just let it go run all the time. So we we had to we had to do a lot of try and error here to come to to decide the auto scaling configuration. There's a bit more about auto scaling here. Is like there are two types of auto scaling. One is vertical, and one is horizontal. Vertical auto scaling is when you just add more resources to a pod, give more juice to the pod saying, okay, you know, if you are throttling, I'll give you more CPU. If you need more memory, I'll give you more memory. And that's vertical scaling. But horizontal scaling is to add more workers, more pods within the same deployment. So based on the, if you want to increase the throughput and based on the traffic, you can increase the number of pods and they will all share the workload. And we're using HPA. HPA can be triggered by three different types of metrics. Let's say resource usage. So for example, if your CPU and memory is going high, the pod is using a lot of CPU, a lot of memory, and you say, after 90%, I want another pod in, the work, in, 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 in my deployment. So you can trigger like that. You can have custom metrics, which is within the Kubernetes. It can be anything. You can have external custom metrics, which is uh, like a PubSub queue, and we are using PubSub queue uh, to, to, to scale our platform. And this is how it looks like in end-to-end uh, -end and how it looks like uh, uh, how we have configured. So as you can see, this is again object storage. You're getting your events here. And then you have HPA configured. And the way we have configured HPA is number of undelivered message or not consumed message by, by, by the service or by the deployment divided by four is equal to pods required, right? So it's easy, but we have sometimes 250,000 files to process and we cannot have thousands and thousands of pods running. So we can, we also have a feature here to set a hard limit that for a particular deployment, you can have, let's say, 700 pods maximum. So it can scale up to 700, but with this formula. Um, so we are scaling the pods. We are, we, are, we are asking Kubernetes to run more and more pods for us, but we also need to scale the cluster. We cannot have a cluster running with 200 nodes. So it has to be also auto-scaled, and we use Cluster Autoscaler for that. Uh, cluster Autoscaler is a, is a tool that automatically adjusts the size of Kubernetes cluster by scaling up 
it, it scales up or scales down by adding like number of nodes or removing number of nodes based on two criteria or two conditions. One is if there are pods in the pending state, as you can see, it, if it doesn't find a place for this pod on a particular node, it will spawn a new node and put that pod there. Also, if a node is being underutilized, that means let's say there is only one pod running on one node, and after, certain, some, after some time it will remove that pod, put that pod back into some other node, and delete that node. This very one, one, one very important thing here is that if you have started your pod with a very few resources, and all of a sudden your cluster is on full capacity, and your pod is running, and your pod wants more memory or more CPU, that that time cluster autoscaler is not going to help you. You have that's why you have to be carefully configure the initial amount of memory and CPU when you're running your pods. We have talked about scaling. We have talked about challenges of scaling PCI platform, and now it's non-PCI platform. Non-PCI platform uses mostly all the connectors because it can literally process anything, any type of file. Um, it is based on the. It is deployed on the same principle: object storage, file events, and the same deployment, same HPA. And the main job the, of of the non-PCI platform is to translate these files into Evro chunked files with the help of schema registry and configuration. Now, Richard is going to explain a bit more into detail how we have set up that configuration to process and translate these files into Evro files. Cool. Thanks, Andy. Um, so as you were saying, you know, we have to process a lot of files, and therefore we need a source of truth about the state of a file and exactly what it means. So the schema registry is a critical component of this entire architecture. So in the PCI environment, all we were doing is purely masking that file in its native file format without any further transformation. You know, that all changes when you get to the non-PCI environment, where there's a need to convert this file from its raw file format into something that's consistent. As we said before, that's Avro. So at a high level, the schema registry contains the metadata for that specific version of the file that's received by the platform and the instructions on how to process it. So you could therefore say we're using the term schema registry in quite a loose way. It's also the config and the instructions as well, along with the schema uh, for you know, the output of that file. So it outlines you know, not only that file, but the specific version of the file and where it sits in the life cycle. So how the schema evolves over time, any transformation that's required in flight, and you know, more importantly, when we expect to receive it. So it's our central source of truth on the end-to-end -end life cycle, and it's utilized by multiple components of the platform. So it gets exported out to Data Hub. It's used by the monitoring service, uh, and it's also used by the destination uh, connectors as well. So how does this work in practice? So the first thing you have to appreciate is, you know, as Sandy was saying, we process over a quarter million files a day. But underneath that is that there's 450 to 500 different versions of those files in production at any one time. So we can't be sure that we're going to receive the same file every single day. So as you can see here, we may receive version 1, version 2, version 3 on subsequent days, and that's fine. But then we may receive version 1 the day after that, and that's a problem because it's a breaking change. And because we deal with multiple external providers, they all have differing maturities in regards to data engineering and the monitoring processes that they've got on their export processes. So it could be that they miss some data in a file, or it could be that it's quite a while and they need to you know, upsert some data, that type of thing. So we had to consider you know, three things. So firstly, logic to determine the version of the schema, version of the file that we're receiving, um, and the fact that we have no control you know, over the quality uh, you know, of the data that we're receiving. And there's no consistent file naming taxonomy here. And what that means is that the version is not specified in the file name. We need logic to look inside the file to work out exactly which version we are receiving. Second is the ability for auto uh, schema migration and evolution. So we need to ensure that there's always backwards compatibility. And this is important for our analytics engineering teams because it means that then there is not 20 different versions of that table in the data warehouse. We minimize it to as few as possible. Uh, and adding a column to a table, for example, doesn't result in a brand new table um, you know, being generated that then has to be union to all subsequent previous versions uh, in the data warehouse. And that gets very expensive if it's not managed properly. 
And the third thing is very much on the self-service nature. So if you go back to the you know, data mesh principles that we started off the session with, you know, it really is critical to scaling this type of operation. And we don't want data engineering expertise to be required just to make a simple change you know, to an existing schema or even you know, to import a very simple you know, new Excel file that's been received. So the schema registry, in essence, is just a collection of JSON and um, you know, YAML files with a fast API front end. So the fact that the schema registry is completely isolated from the core platform code base um, allows you know, the processing of new versions of files without having to, to modify that core code base. And it means that we can open that up a bit wider. So going back to the data mesh principles, this is, you know, also touches on you know, the federated computational governance uh, concerns. Uh, and it assures that you know, we're providing that capability to teams that may sit across the entire business. So jumping into the file, what do we have here? So the first section is very much metadata. Uh, so you have the schema version, the schema name, and you know, description. You know, what, what's this file actually used for as a business? The second section is very much, you know, where are we going to receive this file? So it could be in multiple buckets, as Sandeep touched on before. Um, and then we've got the parser that we want to use to actually process that file. So it could be, you know, your standard CSV parser, your fixed width parser. But what we've got on the screen here is a custom parser that we've developed for a file type that's specific to Visa, uh, the card scheme. We then got the capability con to conditionally process a file. And this is really important because we have some very complex edge cases. So we have one particular file that we receive that has millions and millions and millions of rows. And the first three characters of every single row donate the schema that we need to use to pass that row. And we then basically embark on a one-to-many relationship. So we take all of the rows of that specific schema, put them into one data set, and therefore, it means that our you know, downstream consumers of that data have a nice, clean data set to work with, and they don't have to worry about any of this complexity in terms of you know, the, the upstream raw files that have been received. Then we go into the processing side. So as a rule of thumb, we try and limit the processing um, you know, or the transformation uh, to be as minimal as possible. Um, so here, what we're doing is this could range from just simply renaming columns. So you could receive them as snake case, you want to convert it to camel case, for example. Or it could be you know, the requirement to add new columns. So we refer to these as dynamic columns. So we have certain providers that will you know, send us dates and times as separate columns um, without a time zone. So what we can do here is take these two columns, add the time zone to it, and output a time zone aware timestamp which means by the time it hits the data lake and the data warehouse, we don't have to think about those types of things anymore. We then come to where we want to you know, output the files after we've done this processing. So what you can see here is the, the output bucket with you know, dynamic file names based on input parameters from the raw file. And also on the data warehouse side, the ability to you know, have different configurations for each data warehouse. So here we can export to Snowflake, uh, a specific data set and table. We can also export to BigQuery with a different set of parameters as well. But then you've got the schema side uh, of the schema registry, and this is probably one of the most important components. So here you have a full Avro schema that's defined, and this basically decouples the schema registry from the rest of the platform. Uh, and it means in the future, you know, we can do things completely independently, so replay all data, um, you know, from its raw bucket, uh, and we can deploy you know, additional workloads directly on top of the data lake uh, as well, because the schema is directly uh, you know, bundled with the file as well. And finally, we have you know, the governance side of it. So we have compliance flags here. So did the file originate from a PCI environment? Obviously, when it gets to this stage, it won't have card details, but it's important that we can show complete lineage throughout this entire process. Uh, does the file contain PII, so personally identifiable information that will need to be masked? Um, and then on the monitoring side, uh, you know, a crontab style declaration that says when do we expect to receive this file? So it could be we, you know, by 5 a.m. every single day, or it could be on the 15th of every month at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And this is really important to keep on top of, given the number of files that we're processing. So. Attached to this, we've got the minimum and maximum number of files that we expect to receive. So it could be a file for every single customer, 
which is a very large number, or it could be we just expect to receive one file. And that, therefore, informs the monitoring service, which allows us to highlight any gaps in data uh, before, basically, they hit the downstream teams. So there's also a breach time uh, attached to this, uh, which is triggered off the schedule, um, and the SLA. So it could be it's a critical file that's, you know, in essence, you know, related to our safeguarding procedures, and we need to wake up a member of the team at 2 o'clock in the morning to investigate that further. Or it could be that, you know, we, don't, uh, we haven't received fulfillment uh, files from a warehouse that's dispatching card machines. It's important, but it's something that can be done in business hours. And therefore, this provides the end user with the ability to specify this in a central place without having to get data engineering involved. There's also a final component we haven't listed on the slide, which is the data validation component. And this allows us to validate files as far upstream as possible. So for example, checking that a column is a primary key. The expected range of a column is within certain parameters, that type of thing. Um, because we're operating in a data mesh architecture, it's really important we catch this as far upstream as possible and we prevent this dirty data entering the data mesh. So you could be thinking, well, you can do some of this in cloud functions. Why didn't you go down that route? Well, it's for two main reasons. So we started off with cloud functions uh, and some components are still run on cloud functions, but it doesn't scale. And we realized very early on that we need to change our approach. So firstly, from the cloud agnostic uh, point of view. So we need to ensure that we had a cloud agnostic solution and that there's minimal vendor lock-in. Uh, you know, also this is important for business continuity reasons. So deploying a Kubernetes-based you know, solution gives us the flexibility to deploy in, in any cloud um, without the constraints that, that may be applicable of the, the vendor provider solutions. So we also have the complexity. So as we said before, you know, we're dealing with a lot of different versions of a file in production at any one time. And therefore, we would have to deploy 450, 500 different cloud functions. You know, that's, that's not scalable. Something you can manage in Terraform, but then you have the additional constraints in regards to the different resources that are required for each different file type. And it's something that we really don't want the downstream uh, consumers to have to think about. We want an agnostic solution. So it also kind of limits our, our self-serve capability. You know, we, we don't want people to have to open, you know, PRs against Terraform, all this kind of thing. We want a really simple solution with a web front end, which we do have, um, to allow people to ingest a new Excel file and to get the data engineering team involved. So that being said, we are exploring, uh, you know, CNCF projects like Fission to allow us to deploy cloud functions on top of Kubernetes, so providing us with that flexibility. Um, you know, where it's appropriate. So Sandeep's going to cover how we uh, kind of manage state throughout the entire process. Thanks, Richard. Um, so as you can see, the file is going through a lot of stages, a lot of journeys like connectors, PCI, non-PCI. Uh, and the state management is very important when you're designing a data pipeline. It helps you to be fault tolerant. It will help you handle the errors and uh, it will also support the live monitoring of the file, where the file is at this point, and it also prevents duplicate processing because queues are prone to have duplicate data. Depends on the queue, because we are using PubSub. If we don't process an event within 10 minutes, the PubSub will republish the event in a queue, and we have to reprocess it again. So state management was very important to us. Now, how does that work? When the file gets created, you have a, uh, it, it, it shoots an event, and once the event is published, uh, it's sorry. It's consumed. It goes to to do, and then after, when a pod picks up that event, it checks whether that whether the partic particular file is in progress or it was processed already. If it was processed already, it moves to the next event. If it is in progress, also that also then also it moves to the next event. If it is successful, then your state is success. If it is failed, you uh, it shoots. Uh, it puts the state to error, and then it goes to DLQ. Then we have error playbooks to deal with the, the, the messages in DLQ or the files which are in fail state. There is, an, there is also an edge case where it fails, but we want it to go back to to-do, and that is because of Kubernetes. Um, Kubernetes uh, uh, pods are uh, ephemeral. They, they live for a short period of time, and they can, they can be killed at any point in time uh, and restarted. And because we are processing files, we want the, 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 the application to reopen the file and finish the processing. And in between, if 
Kubernetes send a signal. So how does that work? Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes will send a symptom signal to the pod saying, I'm about to kill you right now. Uh, you have 10 minutes, do whatever is needed. So we have, we call that 10 minutes a graceful period. And in that graceful period, in those 10 minutes, we quickly, quickly do any cleanup if we have to do. And we send a warning as well within our logs. So we know there was a graceful termination is happening. And then we put the status of the file again back to to do and send the message back in the queue so that another pod can come and pick the message and process the file again. And then the pod dies it. Now, uh, monitoring of, 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 of the file events or, or, or the journey of the file is also very crucial to, 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 uh, uh, to, because we are processing a lot of files. And as Richard said, that we, we have a data mesh uh, architecture. That means domains owners can actually actually can see the processing of the file, where their files are, if the files are failed, if the files are processed, things like that. So to do that, all these events are being transmitted or, or are published into a metric store. And that metric store is used by a file monitoring service. And this file monitoring service actually uses the configuration which Richard just explained in the schema registry, the monitoring configuration. Based on that, it performs the aggregations, it performs, uh, it validates whether it needs to send alert to Slack message, or it's a pager duty alert, or it needs to send all the con uh, aggregated information to Grafana Cloud, where we can have dashboards to do a bit more, you know, heavy debugging if the issues happen. And this is how it looks like in end-to-end -end file monitoring. You can see that there is a file type which is called SVXP, uh, and see that stage one the file was in PCI. Stage two, file process in PCI. Stage three, file received in MDM. MDM is non-PCI. And then stage four, uh, schema validation and transformation failed. So here, you it, it failed at this stage, and, and the person who is on support or the domain owner or as a data platform team, we exactly know where the failure happened. We have error playbooks written for every single stage. Uh, generally, 90% of the failures can be solved with those error playbooks, if not, we can just open the file, see what's the issue, and then we then we work from there. And handling replays is 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 also very important uh, uh, for the for the platform because there's so many use cases where you, we want to reprocess the file. Uh, we missed a column to process uh, in a file, and now we need it. So we have to process, let's say, last six months of data to get that column, or uh, errors are happening, and we have to reprocess the file to 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 make sure that the file is processed successfully. So we have created a command line utility, which actually divided into three parts. First part is initialization, in which you set which bucket to target, or which file name to target, or which BigQuery table, which environment, et cetera. And then you have the, the cleanup, where you list everything, and you delete you, the data. So you delete the output error files, you delete the BigQuery uh, data if you need to, and then you say, okay, and also the state, state, you need to delete the state. And then you say replay the file. And replay the file is not actually moving the data back again from the source. You're just actually sending a mocked event in the queue again. And when the mocked event comes in the queue, the platform thinks it's a new file and it just processes the file again. We are also thinking of putting a UI on top of it so it becomes a nice feature for a self serve capability of the data platform. Uh, the last bit of, of, of the platform um, side of things is the infrastructure observability. As we have everything deployed in Kubernetes, a lot of pods and a lot of workloads are running, a lot of services are running, we need to make sure that we monitor that from the infra side. So we take the metrics from Kubernetes through Prometheus, we put the metrics into Grafana Cloud. Then we have Alert Ops, which is an alert manager, which actually uh, we have configured some alerts here, like if the pod is not healthy, if the node is not healthy, if something is wrong, send us a pager duty or a Slack alert. Uh, and that's pretty much it from the platform side. Now Richard is going to go through the summary of the features and everything what we provide in the data platform. Cool. Thanks, Anit. So let's quickly go over what we've covered today. So platform as a whole has the ability to process from all your common you know, sources. So this is your, your object storage or even you know, that one provider that can only send you data by email even in the body of the email. We have the ability to you know, pass those different file formats with ease, and we've abstracted away all that complexity. We have the ability to you know, dynamically manipulate that file uh, as is required. So this is your dates and your times to a time zone aware timestamp, for example. 
The scheming registry is completely isolated from the rest of the platform offering to open up those self-serve capabilities to as wide an audience as possible. The whole platform is fully event-based, so the only scheduling that is mentioned is obviously for the monitoring uh, you know, components. Um, but it doesn't matter if your files arrive one, two minutes past the deadline. They're going to be processed as soon as possible. There's also the high concurrency side. So you know, we will elastically scale as a result for the different you know, business requirements in terms of the transaction volume. That's an increased amount of data that we're going to receive. That's all abstracted away. No one should have to think about it. On the governance side, we've got full monitoring alerting, so complete data lineage from source all the way through to that data, going through the data lake and then into the data warehouse. That's really important, especially when you're running a uh, fintech. Uh, we need to ensure that everything is auditable. We've got data validation, so we can check that the data is correct before it even hits our data lake. Really important when you're running a data mesh architecture that we're doing here. We've also got full regression testing and, and test coverage across the entire platform. This is important to ensure that we're confident with the changes that we're pushing into production and that any changes in regards to transformation is not going to result in bad data coming out the other end that's then copied across the entire data mesh. And of course, as Sandy mentioned, it's PCI DSS level one compliant, so we can process that card detail uh, as well. So as we've covered, you can probably see that we were built upon the contributions uh, of the open source community. Uh, and therefore, we're constantly exploring you know, ways that we could you know, give back to the community. It's ultimately why we're standing here today. So one of the things that we are exploring uh, is, you know, maybe in the future, um, the possibility of open sourcing uh, the platform that we've just uh, spoken through. But what we want to do is get expressions of interest to see if this is a viable option. So if it's something in the future we did embark on, um, that there is a, a market uh, for this moving forward. So the QR code at the top uh, left of the screen there uh, will take you to a quick form. Um, if it is something of interest, please do fill it out. Um, alternatively, um, do reach out to us uh, on LinkedIn. Um, we're happy to take any questions. Thank you.